Coming up on iOS Today, Rosemary Orchard and I have some excellent apps for iPad that you've just got to check out. Plus, I show you a way to keep up with the latest political news in the United States in a really nice format. And Rosemary Orchard shows you an app that will have you creating digital flipbooks in mere moments. It's all that plus so much more coming up on iOS Today. Folks, don't forget to fill out the survey. We are coming to the very end of the door is closing on survey time. If you have not gotten in your responses, now is the time to do so. Go to twit.tv slash survey21 to take it now before it closes on February 8th. Of course, filling out the survey is just a way to help us understand who our audience is out there. Uh, because this is an RSS feed, we don't know uh, sort of specific individual information about any of you, which is a good thing. We like to keep it that way. And instead, we ask uh, that you fill out this survey with, you know, no personally identifying information. You don't have to pop in your email or anything like that. But it just helps us give us a basic understanding of who all of you are out there listening and uh, helps us match our shows and our sponsors and things like that with our audience. So it helps us. It helps you have an even better experience here at Twit. Uh, it's twit.tv slash survey21. And you've got just a little bit of time. So we definitely want you to get in there. Thank you so much for doing that. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Twit. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Get a new career in IT with the best IT education around. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription. Just use code twit30 at checkout. Welcome back to iOS Today, or welcome to iOS Today, depending on when you're watching. This is the show where we cover all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, iPadOS, and all the OSs that Apple has uh, on offer. Yes, folks, that is what we do here at iOS Today. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am the other host, Rosemary Orchard. Hey, Micah. Hello, Rosemary. We have quite the show today. Uh, we wanted to talk about apps that are great, as Tony the Tiger would say, on iPad. Yes, these are the apps that kind of make sense for that large screen, um, work well with the accessories that come with the iPad in some cases, and overall kind of our apps we think that you should consider downloading uh, as part of your introduction to the iPad. Or if you know, you're looking for new ways to use the iPad, these are some of the ways that you can do it. So what we're going to do is start, uh, Rosemary will we'll take the, the top spots and then we'll take a quick break and we'll come back with my picks uh, before we move on to the news. So Rosemary, show us your apps uh, for iPad. Well, my first app is a pick that's been around for a very, very long time, and that is Paper. This used to be by 53, uh, and now it's it's by uh, somebody else. But it's a free application um, with an optional $7.99 a year in-app purchase. But I personally just use the free version. What I love about this is you have books with pages. Um, and so if I add some more pages, then you can see that you can just sort of scroll through these. It's very much like a notebook. And what I love about this is if I tap onto it, then I have this canvas um, and I, I have a palette of tools. Some of these tools do require that in-app purchase I mentioned before, but the tools that I like the most, like this fountain pen here, uh, the marker, um, and there's also a nice watercolor brush, uh, which if I layer it up, then you should just about be able to see, um, is it's a really nice way to sketch in that it's very informal. Um, and it's designed purely just for this. So you're just looking at, you know, I want to make a nice drawing, but the standard markup tools in iOS don't necessarily do it for me. So notes isn't necessarily going to be the great choice because of course, don't forget if you tap on the screen of an iPad with an Apple pencil, um, then you, you just, launch straight into the notes application, then you can write away. Um, but you know, what I, what I love about this is, you know, I have, you know, all these colors and I can just, you know, go in and 
play around with this and make some interesting sketches. So I've used this for just sort of sketching out how I think a room is going to look when I'm when I'm trying to redecorate or um, just planning, uh, you know, little things here, here and there. Or I did a really, really bad drawing of the Eiffel Tower back when I was living in Paris on here. And I just love it for that because it's very simple. Um, but you have, you know, a couple of choices. You can also change the paper. So there's graph paper, there's a line grid, there's dot grid for those people into bullet journaling. There's different storyboards and things like that. There's also checklist paper and lined paper. Um, and then there are some pro options as well, which are for drawing comics or, um, you know, planning how a device screen might look or, you know, a window on, on a Mac OS if you're trying to design an application. And there's also um, different viewpoints, isometric grids, oblique grids and planners as well. So you can use it for all sorts of things. But I love this. Um, and the, the time that I really started using it actually was uh, Serenity Colwell, my co one of your uh, former colleagues oh, uh, back at iMore. She did a great sketch review of iPad in this application. And I just loved it. Yeah. So uh, paper has has been around, uh, as you said, for a long time. Um, it is owned by WeTransfer now. And uh, we're kind of scrolling through the site right now. Um, Anthony is showing some of the stuff that's available. And uh, one of the new things that they've added are prompts that you can kind of get for your, your uh, device. So you can go on and kind of get um, different types of artwork and then sort of practice and learn how to draw them. And so uh, there was just on the screen, it showed uh, these cactus, cacti at the top. No, cactuses? Yeah, no. Anyway, uh, it, sh it showed... Thank you. It showed multiple succulents at the top of the screen. And then it uh, had a tool, like try to make it with this tool. And so you may not be, you know, super equipped to, to I think, how did you describe yourself? Not an artist in the slightest or something like that? Yeah, um, exactly. I'm the furthest possible thing from an artist. If I'm, if I'm doing <laughs> drawings, then they're, they're kind of pretty much done with a, with a ruler or I have a little annotation on them so that if I give somebody a drawing of a penguin, they know it's a penguin, not just a black and white blob. Yeah. So I kind of like this, that there's, um, a store where you can kind of buy these little uh, notebooks that have uh, help to learn how to draw different things. And so you can uh, pick up doodling and understand how to you know, add shadow. Um, or if you kind of do know how to draw and you just want to, um, you just want to kind of have a, a sketchbook to put things, then you can also use that as well. And something that I didn't know that paper was good at, and uh, Anthony, you were just on that part, was it says uh, the quickest way to collage. Uh, my partner does different collages for things, and he has roundabout ways of making that happen that involve like Snapchat um, and screenshotting and all this sort of multiple tool use. Uh, whereas I would just use something like Photoshop and do it all there. But I didn't realize that paper can be used for uh, making quick collage work. And yeah. when you combine that with the Apple Pencil, you can easily mask out the different pieces. That's kind of nice. Uh, sort of making a mood board, if you will, with uh, yeah. with this tool. Yes. Yeah, I would definitely agree. That's one of the features that comes with the, the with the yearly in-app purchase, which is around about eight dollars. Um, and uh, I, I, I really like it. And I find that, you know, the fact that you can have different journals so you can say, hey, these are all my sketches that are related to travel or these are all my sketches related to story ideas. Or you can just create a book that is, you know, going to be a comic book story. And I love the fact that that, you know, that there's a great app for that that's here. And at its core, the app is free um, for the basic things. So that means that everybody can download it and try it and give it a go. And I would highly recommend doing it if you've got an iPad. I would recommend an Apple Pencil. But even if, like me, you have a teeny tiny iPad mini, um, you can use an Apple Pencil with it. Or if you wanted to, uh, a Logitech Crayon, which is available uh, more cheaply. It's around about $50. Uh, though, of course, a Logitech Crayon does not have pressure sensitivity, which does make a difference. That said, you can also just use this with your finger, which is what I was doing just now because the uh, angle that my iPad is propped up at is uh, pretty difficult for uh, sketching. Uh, so I'm the reason why I've gotten quiet is because I'm here um, playing around in in this now. Uh, so there are different things that you can set up. Once you've got an Apple Pencil, you can change what your finger does versus what the Apple Pencil does. And mm -hmm. so 
for example, a finger on the canvas will cut while a stylus is connected. Uh, so let me see what that does. And we'll come back here. And now when I'm drawing with my pencil, or with my finger, I mean, it is allowing me to cut out very terribly. Oh, wait, that didn't work. I wonder why. <laughs> All I want to do, I was trying to cut out this banana, but it's not. What is the tool to use to cut things out? I am not sure. Oh, oh okay. There, I was like, where did Rosemary go? Let me see there it is. Uh, I'm just... Does. Right. Oh, sorry. I got myself stuck in a tutorial. This is not not the right time to be stuck in a tutorial paper. <laughs> We're both very lost. Um, yes. I mean, there are lots of different tools that are available here. I just figured the scissors would be the one that lets you cut something out. But instead, it's just making marks over the top of what I've uh, added. So I don't know why that is doing uh, that. It's possible. Um, so I know that uh, the cut tool is part of um, the cut, but cut collage and, and the diagram tools are all part of the, the yearly pro purchase, um, which you can use. So it's entirely possible if you don't have pro that it's doing something different. I would suggest that it should probably just not be doing something if you're trying to use a pro tool. Um, but uh, for me, if I tap on the scissors, then it just it says uh, join paper pro. And uh, I'm very happy with the free version myself. Gotcha. And I think too, what might be happening, because one of the things that I like about this is that um, the, uh, the, the photos have, you can use your own photos, but you can also use Unsplash. So it's got a, a, a link with Unsplash, which I love Unsplash. I've um, talked about Unsplash before. Uh, it is a place where folks can go and upload photos that they want to make available to people for absolutely free. And this is not CC by Z this is not um, CC by 2.0 or anything like that. It's not uh, Creative Commons licensing in the sense that it's Creative Commons licenses where you have to have a source and link back or anything. You can just use these images without ever having to uh, resource uh, them. And so it's it's a great place to go whenever you're looking for photos to add um, to your document. I don't know what this is doing. Uh, maybe that's what I needed to do. And now, yeah, now the thing is free from the background. Did you Oops. forget to close your circle, Micah? I forgot to close my circle. Um, so yeah, that's that's a lot of fun. And I love the blending tool where as you uh, draw, you can add color to the blender. And as you kind of mix it around, then it gets uh, more colorful. And this was, uh, I remember paper kind of being the thing that inspired other accessory makers to create styluses or styli yeah. or stylies. Yeah. Yes. To create stylies. <laughs> um, <laughs> because this was one of the tools that it's like, Oh, it would be nice if I could have some sort of physical hand thing to draw with, uh, whenever I'm doing this, even though, uh, Steve jobs, you know, held that nobody would want to use a stylus on an iPad. Well, um, you know, in this case, I think that, um, I, I, I think the original quote was actually, if you've got to use a stylus, then you're doing it wrong. Um, that's, and that's something it. you definitely don't need to do for the stylus. But my next pick is also stylus oriented if we're ready for it. I think we are. Tell us about it. Well, my next pick is all about note taking. Now, I mentioned before, if you tap the Apple Pencil on the, the screen of your iPad while the iPad is locked, then it opens it straight into notes and notes is fine. I like it. I don't love it. What I love for note taking is notability. And notability is great because it lets you create notes or do things like import PDFs. Uh, so for example, I've got this uh, plan your year from the suite setup, um, which is a workbook that I want to go through and fill out. Um, but you can also create notes and it's got a lot of tools in it. Um, and it works really well with the Apple Pencil. Now, I don't have an Apple Pencil connected to this device. Uh, I have uh, my, my Logitech Crayon, but what, what I really like and it's very simple, is if you scroll down, then you should just about find, see in the middle that there's a line on this page and it's got infinite scrolling vertically, which means that you know your, your notes are as big as the iPad screen is wide. But then when you get to the bottom of the page, you don't run out of paper because I find when I'm taking notes on actual physical paper, 
then when I get near the bottom, I tend to just leave a gap of an inch and a half or so because it's really uncomfortable trying to, you know, get your hand into that position. And you don't have that with this, which means that you get really lovely full page notes. But Notability can do better than that. It's got a, a, a recording feature in it where you can record and then you can take notes at the same time and you can actually take notes by typing. So you can say things um, and, you know, write anything. I'm just going to write some, some random notes here and then I'm going to stop the recording. And now I should be able to actually play back the recording. And if I go through, then you should see it highlights a word as uh, that's part of the way through this recording. And I can actually tap on, uh, or when I'm in the right mode, I can tap on a particular word and jump to that point in my recording and listen to it again. This is amazing for meeting notes or lecture notes and things like that, where you, you're trying to handle input and also make notes of things. And I really, really, really loved this when I was at university because I would take the PDF of the slides, import it into Notability so I could write on it and draw on it. And I could just circle a massive section when I got stuck and I didn't understand something and then come back to it later and tap on the circle, rewind a couple of times because uh, there's some rewind 10 second buttons and then listen to it again and I would get that section and then I'd actually understand it the second time around. And that is what makes Notability for me the best note-taking application. Yeah, this is a tool that... Um Leo Laporte has talked a lot about on iOS today. It's come up uh, a few times and he really likes it. Uh, God, I just love sketch notes and I wish I could do so uh, because some folks just they listen to a, a talk or something like that and then they end up giving these creating these beautiful notes that um, you I don't know, I'm super envious of <laughs> uh, is kind of what it boils down to. But the idea that you can have um, have a way of of tying the note that you take in a given moment with the audio that happened while you were taking notes. That is not only you know a, a brilliant idea, but it is also one that is tied to um, what we understand about learning. And so it is a a, a very powerful tool for learning, um, just in general, you know, you go to a talk about a given subject and I don't know, uh, let's go with how to wash pillows. And so you're watching a YouTube video that's teaching you how to wash pillows and you're taking notes and you're recording the audio as you're going and you know, you draw a pillow in the notes and you kind of point to it and you do something, you just write a note that on its own without the audio, um, is okay. But if you can look at that and then hear the audio that was recorded during it and have those two things tied together, you are more likely to retain that information um, whenever you are trying to kind of recall it later. So yeah. Notability, I think, is an excellent tool for learning especially. And so if you you know, are, are in lectures and things like that and need to be reminded of things that were said, that's a great way to, to go yeah. about doing it. Yeah, what I also love is uh, it has the ability to, to insert media. And again, this was really useful in lectures because I would frequently tap the plus button, tap on the camera, take a photo of something, a diagram somebody had drawn on the board or a note that a friend had made, and take that photo and drop that straight into my notes as well. And it also has web clips, which will be useful for embedding uh, links to videos and so on that you can just tap on to play back or a section from a website if that's referenced and things like that. So I really love this and it's really amped up my note taking. And I love the fact that I can import PDFs in here. So I actually, you might see a notebook over here on the left called finance statements. I import my bank statements and go through and check things off to make sure I've you know, everything is what it's supposed to be because it's just a really easy app to do that with. Nice, nice. I might have to try this. <clears throat> so when I'm doing um, crochet patterns, um, I will, I go in and I edit the, you know, typically you, you buy a, the pattern somewhere and it's typically provided to you in PDF form. And I will go through and add little check boxes 
to like quite literally edit the PDF by adding little check boxes next to every row uh, so that I can make sure I know where I am. And when I put it down, I can come back and know right where I am. Um, yeah. That's a pretty involved process, but something like this where I can just have the crochet pattern open um, and then be able to literally write on it with the Apple Pencil uh, would be quite nice, I think. So yes. I might have to try that for uh, the patterns that I work on. Well, All I would right. highly recommend it. I've used it for my knitting patterns before. Um, but there's another way we can get creative with the iPad. Are you ready for this, oh, Micah? Yeah. I'm ready. I'm oh, well, ready. this one is coding. Um, and this is something where uh, some people are immediately going to go, oh my gosh, no, 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 no. She's getting very, very nerdy. Yes, I'm getting very <laughs> nerdy. But we're going to play a game. And that is why I love Swift playgrounds. So Swift playgrounds is from Apple and it's totally free. Um, and it has these playgrounds in it at the bottom. Oops, sorry. I've got low battery on this iPad. Uh, I have to plug that in later. Um, and, uh, you there, there's learn to code. And so if I just tap on this learn to code, I've, I've done this a few times before, which is why I've got copy number two here, but it starts with, uh, a little introduction, which tells you about commands and, you know, tells you how to code so that you can actually learn how to do it. And then once you've gone through uh, and you've learned the, the, the few commands that you need to start, you can pa go past the introduction and you can start giving commands. And you actually have a little world to do. Uh, so if I just start by running my code, uh, you can see that my little, my little person's not gone very far. But if I tap into the code and I say, move forward, move forward, move forward, collect gem, and then I try running my code. Then he's going to move forward, move forward again, move forward, and then boom, gem is collected. And my little Dubri What's a Thingy is very happy. And what <laughs> I love about this is, uh, it, you know, it's quite simple. It is teaching you how to code, but it's not necessarily so much about teaching you how to code. You're also having fun. You can create your own playgrounds, but it's also just learning a little bit about what goes into making an application for iOS. Um, or nowadays, even macOS, because Swift works on macOS and iOS. Um, and it's also just learning l that logical thinking that can be really useful as a critical thinking skill. So I would suggest that this is a great application for a lot of kids. And I know a lot of schools are using it as part of their curriculum now if they've got, if they've got a one-to-one -one iPad program. Um, and I just love this. And it's honestly, it's a really fun game. I have spent many an hour on an airplane playing this game, playing the Swift Playgrounds. Now... Tell me about um, the kind of translation of these games into uh, actual coding understanding. Because uh, I think some people would, would wonder, is this a game that is meant for kids specifically and sort of lets you understand the basic concepts, building blocks of coding? Or is this something that someone who is trying to learn coding for the first time uh, who's an adult could also use as a way to better understand how to code. I would suggest that if you're okay with having, you know, if with doing a gamified approach, then this is a great way to do it because uh, I'll just uh, uh, switch back to my iPad and go to the, the next lesson. Um, then um, it, it starts with you're just giving commands, which is running a function. Um, and then it asks you to also make some commands. So you, for example, would need to turn left at some point um, and things like that. Um, and I like the way it builds up. For me, this works really, really well. Um, and I'm 30 years old, so theoretically a grown up. Um, and I <laughs> find this to be great fun. But at the same time, it depends on if you're trying to learn to code for a particular purpose, because if you're trying to learn to code, I don't know, for example, um, to do uh, data analysis, um, then that's going to be a very different, you know, goal to learning to use Swift so that you can potentially create an iOS application. Um, and so I, I would say that it depends on what your end goal is, but if you just want to try something, you own an iPad, preferably one with a Bluetooth keyboard, so you can get, you know, something like a Logitech K380 fairly cheaply from Amazon. And it's a fairly nice keyboard. Um, just any Bluetooth keyboard will connect to an iPad. You don't have to get a smart keyboard or a magic keyboard as lovely as they are. Um, a, you know, just any keyboard, but it's a great way to learn this for free. Um, so, you know, if you already own the iPad and preferably a keyboard, 
then you can actually give this a go for free. So I would say that anybody who wants to learn to code or wants to learn Swift should give this a try. And if you find that it's below your, your skill set and you think I, I can definitely move on to more complex things, there are Swift books that are available in the iBook store. Perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, folks, I think we're going to take a quick break here uh, so that I can tell you about our sponsor today, IT Pro TV. Now, IT Pro TV is there to help you get ready to start your career. I mean, we just talked about coding. So this is the perfect uh, opportunity to talk about IT Pro TV. The tech industry is rapidly expanding and the demand for IT skills in the workforce is growing as well. Yes, even in these trying times, uh, the need for folks with IT skills continues to grow. An IT career can be rewarding and have longevity, which is something we could <laughs> all use in our working lives. Now, they don't just teach you IT skills. They teach you the skills that are in demand. You want to be valuable to your future employers, and you will with IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV tells you what those jobs are and how to get certified for them. One of the best things about IT Pro TV is its wonderful teaching style. In fact, IT Pro TV has seven studios where they teach you the ins and outs of IT and keep it entertaining and incredibly fun as well. One reviewer said, quote, this site has helped me with two certifications and also as the supplemental material for my grad school classes. Give it a try. You won't be disappointed. So just understand that. Not only did it help this person take the time on their own to get those IT certifications, but it turns out that in their grad school classes, the teachers ended up using IT Pro TV as part of uh, the student's teaching. Incredible. You can get the certifications you need all from the safety and comfort of your own home. You can sit back, relax, and watch IT Pro TV. You'll be able to learn at your own pace and on your own schedule. And with more than 5,800 hours of IT training available to stream, you're going to find the right content that fits your educational goals. February is Project Management Month at IT Pro TV, and they're going to have a webinar live on February 11th, on demand thereafter, so don't worry if you can't tune in, uh, called Navigating the Future of Project Management. They have courses in PMP, ITIL, Service Management, and Agile. You can get training in Microsoft, in Cisco, in Apple, in Linux, and more. They're also the only official video training partner for CompTIA. You can get one of their learning coaches along with all of their wonderful job resources to help guide you on your career path. You'll always be supported with IT Pro TV's amazing team. For more insight about IT, check out IT Pro TV's podcast, TechNado, with Don Pizzette, featuring industry guests and IT news recaps for a deeper dive into the IT realm. Get a new career in IT with the best IT education around. Go to itpro.tv slash twit and use code twit30 to receive 30% off all consumer subscriptions. That's itpro.tv slash twit and use code twit30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime, for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. Thanks so much to IT Pro TV for sponsoring this week's episode of iOS Today. And now, Micah Sargent, it's time for you to take it away. Oh, that's me. Thank you, Micah. You're welcome, Micah. All right, folks. Uh, the first one that I want to talk about has a it, it kind of mirrors um it kind of mirrors what Rosemary had chosen for her first, which was paper. Uh the one that I want to talk about is called Tayasui Sketches. And Tayasui Sketches was the app that I uh, ended up settling on after trying so many different sort of sketchy, drawy, writey, <laughs> Apple Pencil uh, loving apps. Tayasui Sketches has a unique style and it has a lot of different drawing tools. And what I liked about it the most was that it 
didn't kind of overcompensate for the fact that you were on an iPad. A lot of the other drawing tools, they kind of went for bigger um, markers and pencils and things like that because, you know, you were using your finger at first. Taiyasui Sketches really made it so that you could do some kind of technical drawing on your iPad. And back when I was doing, I don't, I, now that I don't live in my own house with my own garage that's separate from other people, I don't do as much woodworking stuff because it turns out that trying to run a circular saw uh, with people attached to the left and right sides of you is uh, not the best to maintain good relationships with your neighbors. But back when I lived in Missouri, um, I did woodworking and Tai Sui Sketches was kind of my tool for building out my my patterns and making sure that I had the measurements and things like that that I was looking for. Uh, so this app is available for $5.99 in the App Store. <clears throat> And I there there are different versions. There's Taiyasui uh, Sketches. There's Taiyasui Sketches Pro, which is the Pro version, uh, no ads or anything like that. That's the one that's five ninety nine. Taiyasui Sketches on its own is free. And then there's Taiyasui Sketches School. Um, I'm not sure on the price on that one, but Taiyasui Sketches School is a simplified version that is made for students. That is made for kind of younger kids. And the idea there is that you could put your iPad in the mode where it just keeps that one app up and then kids would be able to use it to draw with it. Uh, so I'll launch Sketches Pro here. And you can see it pops up all these different tools and I'm using my Apple Pencil. Um, so it pops up and you can see <laughs> some silly things that I have in here. It syncs with iCloud. Um, and so I think these were probably just different times when I was trying to show Leo uh, how Taiyasui Sketches works. And you can have different journals. So I've got, you know, sketches. Um, there are some daily activities. This is new uh, so that you can kind of learn to draw is the idea there. Uh, sketches community so that you can see other people's artwork that they've created with Taiyasui sketches and kind of get inspired and then learn, which is uh, little tutorials to help you learn to draw. So I'm going to pop back into sketches and we will... Um, no, that's funny. Uh, this thing that's sinking right now, this was one time when I was trying to create a collage, uh, at the time someone had asked me my thoughts on the different, um, Netflix's Queer Eye, the different characters outfits that they wore to some event, some awards event. And so I took them and sort of broke them up and kind of talked about the different outfits that they were wearing. Um, Okay, so let's go over to the left here and up at the top, we've got uh, a simple kind of, it's like a mechanical pencil. And when you tap on the mechanical pencil or any of these tools, you, you'll see different versions of the, of the tool, different types of kind of brushes, if you will, that you can put onto the, the pencil. So this first one is going to be more um, tilt sensitive. So depending on how I have my Apple pencil, it will change the shape of the pencil as it draws. This one is going to be, the, the second one here is a small circle, so it's going to just be a very accurate kind of smaller circle, then a bigger circle, and then a square option so that the line comes out uh, very square. Well, may, oh yeah, it's just that this is, look at how, so the reason that if you're listening and you didn't hear, or you didn't, you don't see why I kind of paused there. Um, it's because it seemed as if it wasn't drawing on the page, but it actually was. It's just that this is one of the things that I love about Taiyasui sketches is that it really tries to be accurate to, um, the, the, the tool that you're using and the pressure sensitivity. So when I'm drawing, the harder I press, the more that line is going to show up and I can kind of add over the top of it uh, to make it darker. And so let me come back to this tool. I'm going to choose this bottom one, or excuse me, choose the, the top one here, which is the tilt sensitive one. And then I can go through and draw. And again, I think that I might have um, the opacity of the tool uh, adjusted. And then as you can see here, you've got options for blending. Uh, so I can use a normal blending mode or a darkened blending mode. Uh, there's the opacity tool. So yeah. Or no, sorry, that's size. And then the top one is opacity. So I had the opacity set to 26%. And that's why you weren't seeing it as well. Uh, so I'll come back. And now you can see the square. Um, and again, the tilt tool. 
And I'm going to change um, to a brighter orange color here. And then now you start to see the texture of this pencil. Uh, that's the tilt sensitive one. So depending on how I draw with the pencil, it's going to change the color and I can uh, switch to a different tool here. So this is a very, very, very fine uh, drawing tool. And I like to use this one with blue. And you can see it's kind of like a, a fine tip Sharpie there. And so it makes these very clean lines where the edges are the only parts that kind of have um, have the, the, the thicker portions because of the tool that I'm using. So I need to turn on my do not disturb. Uh, here's a, a thicker tool. And check this out. There are some different options here to kind of make a difference depending on how and again, which position your Apple Pencil is in. Uh, this is a great calligraphy pen. Um, let me try to remember now how to clear. It's been so long since I have uh, hopped into Taiyasui Sketches and... Clearly you need now. to uh, stop doing the woodworking at 3 a.m., Micah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I need to stop doing crochet and woodworking and get back into Taiyasui sketches. Uh, so let me erase this just so I can kind of show the different types of tools that are available. Um, so, you know, you could write a word. Let's go with one of my favorite words to write to test a new pen, which is lemon. Um, so... You could see that you could easily, if you know a thing or two about calligraphy, uh, you could very easily uh, draw some very beautiful calligraphy skills. There's a brush tool. So this is going to have um, incredible changes depending on the tilt of your Apple Pencil and the thickness that you choose to write with. Uh, this is like a, a smudge tool. So like charcoal and... Another, this is a brush as well, watercolor brush. Um, another brush. So see, we recommend to use watercolor on a layer set to darker, to darken mode. So we will create a new layer. And on this layer, we'll choose darken. And then with this, I will choose a new color. And you can start to see how it interacts. And the cool thing about this watercolor one is that it kind of bleeds as you're writing. So as I draw there, you can see that it changes the shape of that watercolor over time. Um, airbrush tool. <laughs> yes, it even has an airbrush. And I can kind of ooh, yeah, spray the, the display. And then um, the pen tool that is really uh, kind of tied to the pressure of the screen. Um, from there, you can add patterns to the to the back of your display. So, you know, behind everything, you could uh, have dots, you could have all sorts of things here. Of course, your eraser tool, the tool that lets you um, blend and uh, take portions of it and kind of smudge it. And then you can cut cut parts out that you might want. And then the ruler tool, which lets, you, which lets you not only draw lines and circles and things like that, but um, lets you create on the screen uh, line, uh, an area that you can quite literally draw. And I'll change this to red, uh, draw across, and it will create a, come on, straight line uh, with that tool. So this is kind of a full featured app uh, for sketching. And as I showed, excuse me, as I showed before, it also uh, works quite well for uh, collages and, and things like that. But now this beautiful piece of artwork, which I'm selling on Etsy uh, for $399.99. Um, oh, you're underselling there. yourself there, Micah. A long way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was able to create in Taisui Sketches a $400 painting in no time at all. Uh, but no, I, I really like Taisui Sketches um, and its ability to <clears throat> use so many different tools that are available. Yeah. Now, 
Anthony, if you could stay on that for a second, uh, Anthony is currently scrolling the the website and for folks who are listening. And one of the things that I love is that there you can see how the different tools work, kind of what they are intended to be used for with the pencil, the pen, the marker, the fine point marker, the brush, et cetera, et cetera, uh, including that pattern brush, which is kind of neat, and the smudging tool so that you can draw with the graphite pencil and then use the smudge tool to kind of add um, blending uh, between things. And then the eraser, it doesn't have to be uh, completely erasing. You can kind of erase parts of it. And so as that little note says there at the bottom, the most realistic tools, that is so true that this really does have such detail uh, and pattern kind of the, the, the pattern ability that it has to make it so that it's not just, you know, essentially all of these are just markers with different um, levels of blending on the outside. No, these tools, they created in a way that they feel like those real tools that you would be using. And now uh, Anthony's showing this cool video of someone creating a little plant in a pot, excuse me. And it's, uh, you know, slowly building out the, the texture and the color of the pot itself, uh, using that blending tool to make changes to the, the light that's hitting it, um, adding soil with stones and making adjustments to the size of the brush that's being used, then kind of blending those colors together, adding depth and, and shadow with the different tools, uh, just little C's, which is kind of fun that it can do that. And then as the person is going with the watercolor tool especially, you can see how the watercolor tool can be used to blend colors together um, and really add a level of detail that I think you're not going to get in a lot of different apps because they took the time to kind of figure out how to get the texture mapping uh, to work in a way that feels realistic. And then at the end, you've got a nice pencil sketch or excuse me, plant sketch, which is very cool. So yeah, that's Taiyasui Sketches. Again, available for the, the pro version is available for $5.99 in the App Store. It's a one-time purchase and I think it's well worth that $5.99 price but really, truly well worth it. I'm going to be getting price. that just for the calligraphy Nike because calligraphy is something that I always want to learn, but I I, I stuck as sticking with it because I, I don't have the tools with me all the time. Um, and it feels like effort to get up and get them. But if I can just do this with my Apple Pencil and my iPad, then I'm going to, I'm going to give it another shot. So I'm grabbing that one. Awesome. I'm excited for you. Uh, I'm just scrolling through now. One last thing I'll show. So I tapped into the learning. And so there's getting started to learn kind of the basic tools of using Taisui sketches, uh, but then also how to share your sketches with the community, uh, changing paper size. So these are tutorials that kind of teach you how to use uh, the app itself. But as you're learning how to use the app, it's also showing you this with sketches. So for this example, uh, use the stipple brush to add textures and shading. Um, the fill tool, how you can use that. Zen mode, which uh, I kind of like. It's just a mode to kind of remove all those tools on the side so that you can just draw as you want to. Um, changing the gradient and colors, the pixel tool, which that's technically uh, uh, the pixel tool is a, a brush that's available or it's a tool that's available in almost every brush where you just choose the square and then you dot, 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 dot um, instead. The watercolor tool, et cetera. Um, oh, and I love this. Add grit with the sanding tool. <clears throat> so this, this is one of those tools that I think kind of sets this one apart um, to, to create more texture, to create more interaction between uh, the artwork that you have. And this will, for anyone who's in Photoshop, who uses Photoshop, this will be reminiscent of some of those Photoshop brushes that you can buy um, that that kind of add this gritty texture to it as you're, as you're using it. So yeah, I think this is a really cool app and can hopefully inspire you. Oh, and then of course, exporting in Photoshop, uh, format in SKT format, which I'm not sure what SKT is. Um, oh, that might be the native format for sketches. Uh, and then, oh, I forgot about the symmetry, symmetry tool. I'm, I won't go get into it, but 
the, that's kind of a, a popular form of drawing these days is a tool that uh, it basically creates a line down the center of your document. And then what you draw on one side is repeated on the other side. And so you can create really cool like mandala effects. But also, as you can see, this artist has created uh, a bird using the symmetry tool. So they kind of created the original sketch in the background and then they turned on symmetry with from the ruler. And then as they start to draw, it repeats the on the uh, left and right side to make their drawing into what they were going for. And then again, the painting is is repeated on either side as well. So anyway, this tool is just it's so full featured. And for five ninety nine, I think it, you really can't beat you can't beat that uh, one time yeah. five ninety nine price. Yeah, that's great. And uh, just to confirm, SKT is indeed the the native format for Taya City Sketches. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let us talk about another incredible app. Uh, this app is Pixel Mater Photo, available for $7.99 in the App Store. Um, if you have an iPad and you don't have this app, you're doing it wrong. I'm just, I just got to say that because... Pixel Mater Photo is the, in my opinion, the best photo editing app for iPad. There are lots of photo editing apps for the for the Mac that are you know uh, different and better for individuals. But if you're just looking for, I want to edit photos and make them look good, and you know a couple of things, then you should check this out. But even if you don't know a couple of things, I want to show you one of my favorite tools that. I like to use because it's so helpful as a jumping off point. So um, I've got a photo here that I took the other day of my new uh, Unity band for my Apple Watch. And this tool lets you, um, or I, I pulled it open in uh, Pixelmator Photo. And one of the things is that your iPad, uh, if you've got a newer iPad, it's one of the best screens that you can have on a device. And so you've got this huge... Uh, even in the, even in you know my size of iPad the what uh, ten point five in, inch size it's still quite a large screen in comparison to the iPhone that you may have shot it on which is where this photo was taken was on my iPhone and I can see so much of it it's uh, color accurate and then the combined with what the what Pixelmator Photo offers I get so many options here so I'm going to tap in the top right here on the sliders menu and you start to see already what we're working with. So down at the bottom, there are different filters that I could use if I wanted to, uh, to add to this, uh, this photo to, to change it as I wanted. But I want to talk about what you see here in the top right. Um, we've got, uh, the histogram up here at the top with different colors, red, green, blue, and then the overall histogram. And I can make adjustments to starting with white balance. Um, hue and saturation, lightness, color balance, uh, selective color changes, levels, curves, vignette. Uh, I can add sharpen. And then there are also these tools, replace color, black and white, color monochrome, sepia, fade, channel mixer, invert, uh, and grain, which is one of my favorite things to do to a photo. So I, if you know a thing or two, then you might go and hop into the curves uh, menu and you're like, oh, I know that, well, the reds need to be adjusted this way across this curve and uh, we need to take the, 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 the blues and, and bring down the, bring up the darkness of the blues and we'll add just a few adjustments here. Uh, like, so I don't know what the heck I'm doing. So I don't <laughs> fool around with all that. I don't know <laughs> kind of what these individual things mean uh, and how they make adjustments to the photo. But what I love, sorry to shout, but what I love about Pixelmator Photo is that you see this button up here in the top, uh, it's the top right side. It's the leftmost thing. It is a little magic wand that has the letters M and L below it. What do those M and L stand for? You guessed machine it. It's machine learning. learning. Ding, 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 ding. I can tap that button. <laughs> I love that feature too. It's the best. It's so great. I tap that button and it it looks at the photo and does its machine learning magic to kind of figure out what the subject is, kind of what the photos, uh, what the scene is, and then uses that to inform how to make adjustments to the photo. So I'm going to tap that button. And wait, what? It's already done? I'll turn it off. Mm -hmm. Boom. What? It's a, wow. 
that is how quick uh, yeah. it works on the iPad with the you know incredible chips that are in here. And then now I can go in and I might make adjustments. So for example, I tend to like a bluer photo for some reason. I don't know why. I just I just do. And so I might not like the uh, what machine learning did with the white balance. And so instead, I might go in and choose uh, the gray point like so. See, I do secretly know a couple of things about editing photos, just not everything there is to know. Um, and then hue and saturation, I think, uh, you know, I'll turn that off sometimes and see, oh, no, that looks great. They really did a good job there. Uh, same thing with lightness. I think that looks good. Um, color balance across those different colors, that's good. Um, selective color, I never really know what that's doing precisely, uh, but I'll just turn it off and turn it back on and see which one I like better. And then from there, these tools are not tied to machine learning. So I might want to, oh, maybe I want to add some grain. Not in this photo. It doesn't really make sense, but I could. And then um, I'm good with the photo as far as that goes. But I notice over here in the right is just a little speck of something that doesn't look great in this photo. So I'll tap that little bandage icon. And I will, down at the bottom, change the size of my brush. And then I will, with my Apple Pencil, draw over that dot. And then, oh, there's no more dot. And Magic. then I can kind of show you, oh, there it is before. And now it's gone. Before, gone. Before, gone. Can't even tell that it was removed. Um, it's one of the things I love about a Pixelmator photo. photo. That ML also stands for just magic learning, I think. They, they've got magic in there, I'm sure, because I, 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 I'm I not very good at editing photos, but I can do it with Pixelmator photo. So I love your pick here, Micah. Yeah, ex exactly. That it is, it is magic because I don't get how um, how exactly it works. Uh you know, I'm sure if Ant Pruitt watches this, he'll he'll be chuckling because uh, he's like, curves, you know how to do curves. It, it works like this. There's also tools for machine learning cropping. So this isn't a great photo mm -hmm. to provide as an example of that because um, it's it, there's not like an actual person or subject to use, uh, but it will properly crop your photos if you're not sure how to do that. Um, and then Net to the right of the machine learning tool is this, these little, um, they're sort of, it's a square and there are thicker, excuse me, circles in the top left of the square and they get kind of smaller as they transition to the right bottom portion. And that is a tool called ML super resolution. And again, ML stands for machine learning. And what this does is it lets you take a photo and uh, it can be a smaller photo and you hit this button and it uses machine learning to increase the resolution of that photo so that when you zoom in on it, it doesn't look uh, blurry. So let me see about, um, I'll hop out a crop here and we'll go to 150 and I'm going to hit that button. This does take a little bit longer for the app to chew on. So you can see it's kind of loading as we go. And so it's looking at that whole photo. It's MLing uh, to kind of figure out uh, what this, what individual pixels make up this photo and kind of chewing on it to figure out how to properly uh, make the resolution even higher than it is. And mind you, this was taken with the iPhone 12 Pro Max. So already a pretty uh, good photo size and resolution is pretty good as well. But it's going to take it even a step farther here. And so let me zoom in kind of, I think, to a severe point on the digital crown, which is uh, got these little, you know, nubs on them. And I'll do the before and after so you can kind of see. So here's the before. And this might be kind of hard to see now that I think about it on uh, the video because the video is not going to be as uh, high resolution as I'm seeing on my iPad, but we'll see if you can kind of tell the difference. So this is the before. And then as I take this and swipe it across, this is the after. So what it's done is <clears throat> there are these little lines, these little black lines that run across the um, the digital crown and those little black lines are kind of the ridges and on the un hyper super resolution photo you can see the individual pixels that make up those ridges so it 
uh, kind of like makes these jagged jumps down as it's kind of drawing out the, the ridges. But when I take it and move it to the left to show the new version, it smooths those out and kind of turns the individual pixels into a much higher. Yeah, there you go. Now you can see the difference. So there's that before and there's that after before and especially look there on the left. So here's the before. And then as I swing that across, look what it did. There's the after. See, it really makes it look like it's, you know, full texture instead of just individual square pixels that make up the photo. So this is a really cool tool and I love to use it for um, photos that are kind of smaller that I want to, to put out. Um, in, you know, where, wherever, wherever I need to use them. Um, I've used it before. Anthony, you asked for uh, our, um, Memoji photos, uh, last, I think it was last episode. Yeah. And the Memoji photos are pretty low resolution standard. And I'll typically take those Memoji photos and drop them into Pixelmator Pro to super resolution them before I use them or send them out. And so and that, that's a great way to, to go about that. All right. So that is Pixelmator Photo. Again, if you have an iPad and you don't have this app, you are doing it wrong. And, you know, I'm just going to put it like that. $7.99 in the App Store. Uh, you got to get this app. It, they will routinely put it on sale even more so than it is. Um, I think $7.99 is an incredible price yeah. uh, for what you get from this app. But it's just so good. Pixelmator yeah. Photo. Awesome. All yeah, right. It's a great app. The last app we're talking about today is Home Plus. Uh, so in the App Store, if you go look this app up, it's going to say Home Plus 4. But it's technically Home Plus 5. <laughs> so oh. Home Plus 4 is the App Store listing for the app. But the developer just recently updated the app. Uh, and so if... if yeah, exactly. There we go. So um, the new version, Home Plus 5, is Home Plus 4, but made new. <laughs> uh, here's where I want to start. If you go to the App Store and look for Home Plus, you are going to see that the app is $14.99. And that is not uh, a price that most people, uh, or that I shouldn't say most people, that many people feel kind of comfortable with. They're kind of like, oh my goodness, why is that so much? But if you are a smart home person, if you are into the smart home, if you like the smart home, uh, this is the home app made incredible. Uh, it is a mm -hmm. highly detailed sort of power user app that lets you make adjustments to your smart home exactly as you want them using Apple's HomeKit uh, system. So $14.99 one-time price is not so much that it's not worth that cost. One time you spend 15 bucks on it and you've got this great app, uh, including I didn't know that the developer was working on the next version, but because I had purchased Home Plus when it first came out, I was able to get it, uh, get the update. So let me launch it here. Uh, there we go. And the the first thing that you're going to see is if you've got multiple homes, and of course you would choose a different home, but I've just got the one HomeKit home. And there are different options here. So there's the summary of all of your devices, lights, switches, outlets, temperature, sensors, cameras, bridges, and then favorites that you can add. So I'll go to outlets, for example. And in each of these, I can see a summary at the top to kind of talk about the status of these individual ones. So there's one outlet that's turned on, one that's turned off. I can choose lights. Um, here you can see the lights that do color. Uh, there are 10 that are turned off and five that are turned on. The dimmable lights that I have, seven are turned on, 10 are turned off. And then lights uh, that don't dim or color, uh, nine are turned on and... Um, uh, 12 are turned off. So then you can see each individual light. So I'm going to go back to outlets and uh, each of these has a little uh, three dots there and tapping on that, that's the more button. I can see individual information for that. So I can make an adjustment by turning off or on this plug, but then I can scroll down 
and see the current power state of the plug, see, you know, outlet is in use, display it as, do I want to display it as an outlet or do I want to display it as a light bulb or a fan? Um, add it to my favorites, how it's working, which is via the Homebridge app or the, yeah, the Homebridge system. And then uh, the room that it's in, I can choose to group it with other accessories, which is a thing that you can do within the home app. And what I love is that this app does its best to mimic the look and feel of the home app so that you kind of feel comfortable within the app, even if you're not, um, you know, using the the other app. So I'll choose um, sensors and you can see all of these different sensors, the, the dining room sensors and what they're showing. Uh, there's motion occupancy, there's the humidity, the air quality, uh, CO2 readings. Some of these like the uh, battery information, which is kind of cool. If I tap and hold on that and choose info, then I can see the hue dimmer switch and see information like what is the current battery level? Is it a low battery or not? Uh, what's the charging state? Of course, this is a non-charging uh, battery, so it doesn't have a charging state. And then it also has information like the um, the the you know the the company that made it, the model number, and those kinds of things. Uh, down from there is automations. And what I love about this is that in the home app, the automations menu doesn't actually reveal all of the automations that you have set up. It only reveals the ones that are kind of what look like automations on the face of them, I guess. But with this, I can not only see the automations that I've set up within the home app, which is when the last person leaves home, do blank, but also automations for uh, the canvas that I have in my living room where if you double press on the canvas, it does one thing. If you long press on the canvas, it does one thing. And if you single press on the canvas, it does one thing. And so each of those, of course, is a, is a separate automation that will make changes to the lights in my house. So that is kind of every automation that you could possibly have. It shows you all of the scenes that you have and the scene that's activated right now, all of your rooms, and then your zones too, which is something that's a little bit less easy to adjust in the home app. Um, I can tap to add a new scene if I want to and try out that scene or I can pop in um, and go back to automations, tap to add a new automation and you can store automations in folders. Uh, so let me just give this a name, test, done. We'll add an event so we can do location, presence of people, time of day, or an accessory state. So let me choose presence of people. Uh, and yeah, we'll do when I arrive home or when anyone arrives home. And then you can also add a condition. So you can say, I want it to be when anyone arrives home after it's dark. So we'll do time of day. And time is between. Let's do after sunset. I, I don't know what that. Oh, I see. No time offset. So you can actually say an hour after sunset, which is kind of cool, or two hours after sunset. And you can add multiple conditions. So it could be when anyone arrives home after sunset, but only when blank is also true. And then you add your accessory and tell the accessory what to do. So I want this light to turn on or this light to turn off. So you could technically do this when anyone arrives home after sunset and the lights that you're trying to turn on are off. So if those lights are off and somebody arrives home and the sun has already gone down, then go ahead and turn on my lights. But if those lights are already on, then I don't need you to turn off, turn on the lights. So there's an example of kind of uh, one of the ways that you can get very powerful with this, um, which is something that I, I feel is not as easy to do in the home app is kind of dig into those scenes and automations and really uh, go in and, and make those adjustments. Um, the home app is this home plus app, I should say is also good for uh, looking at individual accessories and kind of pulling them apart and understanding what each of them uh, does and what kind of functionality is available for each of them. So let me see, we'll do um, the iDevices plug. 
So along with seeing kind of these, these basic details, you see here that there's an option for advanced features. If I tap on that, then you see a bunch of different stuff in here uh, that has unsupported features. Uh, so <clears throat> this first one, I don't know exactly what this is. Uh, February 5th, obviously it's, it's the date, but there's a specific time in there. Um, this one has some custom settings, some more custom settings all the way through down to the bottom. And so if the developer doesn't know what the features are, meaning that they can't show it in the app, what you can actually do is send an email to the developer saying, hey, here, have this. See if you can't figure out what it is and make it available to me to make adjustments to in the app. So love that. The developer is always kind of working on it and improving on it. But um, as a kind of hub for your smart home, I think that the uh, Home Plus app is, is good for providing that functionality there. Yeah, I use pretty much exclusively the home plus app. I rarely open the home app itself. I do, I do as much as I can in home plus just because of those additional conditions. So for example, saying, you know, when, when the lights are off in the bedroom and it's after 10 PM, the motion sensor should not trigger. So if the motion sensor trigger, you know, if the motion sensor triggers, then I, I only have it trigger up until 10 PM because if the lights are off in the bedroom, but if the lights are still on, you know, if one light is on, then, you know, it, it's good to go. Um, and I love the fact that I can do that with the Home Plus app uh, because that's something that you, you can't really do with other apps. And there are a few alternatives out there, but the Home Plus app is just so beautifully polished. And I love the fact that I can actually assign uh, pretty icons to things. So I have my washing machine and my tumble dryer connected. And in the UK, they're all two, uh, 220 volts. So I've got them connected to Eve Energy uh, plugs for monitoring. Uh, but I can actually have them show up as a washer and a dryer. So... That works really well. Yeah, awesome. Uh, let us move on to our next segment. It's time for the news. All righty, folks. I don't know about you, but I am very excited about uh, a potential, well, most likely uh, a change that we'll see in the final version of iOS 14. Point five, excuse me, I was just coughing, uh, which is going to allow you to use your Apple Watch to unlock your iPhone when you're wearing a mask. So this functionality, uh, you, if you have a phone that does Face ID, you may have been frustrated with the fact that while you're wearing a mask, if you try to unlock your iPhone, it at first would just sort of error out, error out, error out, error out. I think about three times, if I remember correctly. And then it would show you mm -hmm. a prompt to type in your password. Apple yep. updated that so that when you looked at your phone, if it recognized that you were wearing a mask, then it would automatically just right there prompt you for your password. Now, as a person who is who covers tech and is therefore kind of... Um, just the 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 stand-in for the proxy for all tech frustration when family and friends <clears throat> were bothered by this you know then they usually would complain to me um and so that on its own was kind of like i understand this is a frustration for you and it, it does suck and hopefully there will be some improvements but that goes a step further or farther when your um partner works in a public facing job when they work in a job where they interact with uh, the public and my partner does and he of course because now for some reason if you if you work in a job where you interact with the public not only are you doing your job uh, that you you know signed up for but you are also becoming a like person wrangler who has to tell people uh, please wear your mask and, and, uh, please, you know, don't stay in this part. You need to, uh, stay outside all those things. You become a public health uh, inspector as well, which is ridiculous, but they, they, that becomes part of their job. And so for him, the most frustrating thing was not that he himself couldn't unlock his phone with his uh, face ID. It was that customers when they were unlocking their phones with face ID would take their mask off to do so. And so they, you know, time and time again, were removing their masks and potentially risking uh, everyone else around them by doing so. And so that was something that, you know, I certainly had uh, 
there was more empathy there than there was with just like the, the base frustration. There was already plenty, like I had a plenty of understanding for that, but this goes a step farther because that's so much more, uh, troublesome. And whenever you have to say, I'm sorry, but you can't use face ID to unlock your phone. We need you to wear your mask while you're indoors. That's the requirement of our, you know, business. Um, so he, more than anyone I've talked to, was really excited to hear about this change coming uh, to iOS. And it was interesting because he had some questions about it as well that I hadn't considered, um, <clears throat> including what happens if I'm wearing my Apple Watch and I'm across the room and someone picks up their picks up my phone wearing a mask, is it going to unlock the phone? And uh, so I ended up kind of showing him how it worked and what it did. And Rosemary, you are going to show us here on the show uh, how yeah. this works. Okay, so step one, a mask. This is a Uniqlo Aerosome mask for anybody curious, because if I don't say, we will have questions. Yes. So. <laughs> All right, I've got this on. So my face is covered and I'm just going to switch to showing my iPhone. And now if I swipe up to unlock, it says it's unlocking with the Apple Watch. And uh, it actually does say that it's unlocking, uh, but my video appears to have frozen. Ah, there we go. Wonderful. And uh, that's a question that we've got maybe for next week on the show. But it has just unlocked. And uh, that is working extremely well for me. I'm really impressed with it. I've been using it for a couple of days. It just works. You do need to set it up. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that you'll do in the settings. But I'm hoping by the time iOS 14.5 launches that there will be a prompt in there to enable that if your watch is up to date or once your watch updates. Um, yes, I'm, because that's I'm something you just change in the settings. Yeah, exactly. I'm pretty certain there will be a prompt, but you will need to be running the latest version of watchOS and uh, the latest version of iOS. That's iOS 14.5 and watchOS, I believe, 7.5 as well. Um, in order for that to work. And that means that some of the older Apple Watches will not support this feature. Um, but what I found really interesting about this, uh, John Gruber on Daring Fireball wrote a little bit about it, is essentially when you unlock your phone with Face ID, if your Apple Watch is on your wrist, but it's not, but it's uh, locked at that point, it unlocks it. And it was set up so that the phone could say to the watch, hey, you're good to go now. But it was never set up so that it could do it both ways. It was set up as a one-way path. And so they had to re-engineer it so that it could go in both directions. Um, because, of course, it would be a bit of a security flaw if you can unlock your phone with your Apple Watch and your, your you know, but your Apple Watch is locked and things like that. So I can, I see why it took them quite a while. And I know for a lot of people, it seems very obvious. Surely I have an Apple Watch, you know, it can unlock my Mac. Why can't it unlock my iPhone? It, it's, these things are never that simple. Uh, but I'm really exactly. pleased to see that the engineers have got this and it works so well. I'm so impressed and it makes shopping so much easier because I, I use the the app uh, for the grocery store so I can scan the things as I go around um, and add them to my basket. And then I just scan a barcode at the checkout. It transfers the data. I pay with Apple Pay. Everything's already bagged in, in the trolley and I'm gone. Um, wow. And uh, that app does not, for some reason, support. Uh, it, it insists on locking my screen frequently. It's very annoying. So, But if I lock my phone, it doesn't lock the app. Um, so, uh, now I, I have a way better chance of that actually working all the way around the grocery store. So I am very, very pleased that this is here and I'm, I'm sure everybody I know that's got an Apple watch will be pleased. And I think some people that don't have an Apple watch might now go, you know what, actually I can see the use case for this. Uh, and there are so many more uses for the Apple watch than just unlocking your iPhone. Yeah, this exactly. Is great. Um, so with that, the, one of the, a couple of things that I wanted to note, um, when you, do that face ID while you're wearing your mask, the Taptic in engine in the Apple Watch will on your wrist to let you know yeah. that it's happening and give you a notification. And to answer that question that my partner had, um, where he was like, okay, but what if somebody else, you know, picks up your phone? First of all, there's proximity magic involved. So your watch yeah. has to be within a certain distance of the phone when that happens. But also... When you get that notification with the buzz on your wrist, the notification that says your watch is being unlocked has a button underneath it that says lock iPhone. 
And so yep. if you look over and your phone's sitting there and somebody's picked up your phone messing around and has unlocked it, you hit that lock iPhone button and your phone will lock automatically. And then yep. your, your password will be required to enter into the phone at that point. So it, yep. it's got the, those security features, uh, in place, but that's also why it's in beta right now. Uh, so that we can continue to see, uh, changes that need to be made to make sure that it's secure and, uh, folks out there who want to get early access to this, it is, it just got rolled out into the public beta. Um, so you can also download and get it and give it a try if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. That's watch OS 7.4 and iOS 14.5. And both of those are in public beta right now, but of course it's a beta, you know, at your own risk or wait a couple of weeks and hopefully Apple will roll that out to everybody. <laughs> Um, yeah. So another thing, so we've talked before on this show and, uh, on, I've talked on several shows about Apple's new rumored, um, headset. Uh, originally it was Apple glass, which was an augmented reality device. Uh, that still may be coming, but maybe sometime down the line. And then I think it was Bloomberg and some other sites that had, uh, news that there was going to be a virtual reality device. And now the information is out with a new report that says Apple is working on a mixed reality headset. Uh, so this is, and, and I'm going to read directly from the article here. <clears throat> a mixed reality headset Apple is developing will be equipped with more than a dozen cameras for tracking hand movements and showing video of the real world to people wearing it, along with ultra high resolution 8K displays and advanced technology for eye tracking. Uh, this device will cost um, significantly more than the $300 to $1,000 for existing VR headsets from Facebook's Oculus and others. Last year, Apple internally discussed pricing the product around $3,000, which is more than the starting price of the company's high-end laptops, but it is around the $3,500 price that Microsoft charges for its mixed reality headset, the HoloLens. Uh, Apple is a goal has a goal of $250,000 uh, selling 250,000 of these. Um, it blocks peripheral vision, which you might expect. And the cameras on the outside can pass video of the real world through the visor and display it on screens to the person wearing the headset, which of course creates a mixed reality effect. Uh, Apple is developing multiple technologies to control the headset. There could be a thimble like device that could be worn on a person's finger that lets them interact with the software. Um, but there's no word on whether that would be bundled or if that could be an addition. Uh, and there's apparently a physical dial akin to what the AirPods Max have um, for interacting with some of the software. And it can quickly map objects in physical space, allowing the user to play something like a virtual game board on a real coffee table. There's an outward facing display as well, which the could be used so you can see when you're, you're charging information while it's sitting down. Um, and then interchangeable headbands so that you could add spatial audio to the system uh, as well. And as, as I mentioned, 8K displays um, built into the headset would be wow, wow, wow. Uh, that more than almost anything else could be what makes this device kind of a, a real... Uh, game changer, uh, if you'll pardon the pun. So I don't know. Uh, $3,000 is a lot of money, more than I've ever spent on an Apple laptop or uh, iPad or iPhone. Does that shock yeah. you? It does, uh, mostly because I think I can pay my mortgage for a year uh, for that. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe maybe not quite, but you know, it's, it's a lot of money. And I mean, I've I, my my curiosity with these things is, you know, what what is going to be their unique selling point that is worth it for that price? Because somebody like me who's there going, should I buy an Xbox or shouldn't I buy an Xbox? Hmm, it seems like a lot of money. Am I going to play it enough? A three and a half thousand dollar headset is a lot of money for something that is going to be a new technology. And, you know, and, you know, it, it just, I, I'm a little concerned that at three and a half thousand dollars, there's going to, it's going to outprice a lot of people just by default because they won't even consider it. Um, and the rumors do that as well, to an extent, you know, hearing rumors about the fact that it's going to be super expensive kind of just gives 
people this negative image in their head of what it should be like, and then they just don't don't think about it. So, yeah, I I'm concerned, but we'll see. I mean, hopefully, it's it's really going to be absolutely amazing and wonderful. And um, you know, when there's no more pandemic, we'll be able to borrow one from the library and give it a try. Yes, exactly. That's that's what I'd like to do because they're so oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I think that the eventual product that Apple wants to launch is not going to cost three thousand dollars. The the AR, the Google, the Google Glass, the Apple Glass um, that the company is reportedly working on. I think that that's going to be a whole different thing. Um, and you know, we never know either with the price here. Uh, could be the the M1 Max cost less money than a lot of people expected. Um, the kind of remakes of some of the devices cost less than people expected. Uh, but this is also the company that had a ten thousand dollar Apple Watch, so you know it, it's quite possible. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on: the Super Bowl is this weekend. If you didn't know, uh, for those of you outside of the the country. And who may not know, the Super Bowl is a big football event that we have here in the United States. And by football, I don't mean soccer. Um, I mean the one played with the pigskin. And it, it basically the teams play all year and then the best two teams uh, face off in a great battle between the most important thing, which are the advertisements that take place at the Super Bowl uh, this year. <laughs> My mom's team, and yes, I am contractually obligated to say it like that. My mom's team, the Kansas City Chiefs, um, we live in the Kansas City area, uh, are facing off against some team that has Tom Brady in it. Um, I'm just I'm looking at this image here, and I see Tom Brady, and I see the guy that's the Kansas City Chiefs guy. So, uh, oh, the Buccaneers, the facing off against the Buccaneers. I thought Tom Brady was a Patriot. Anyway, it's the Buccaneers versus the Kansas City Chiefs, and um, Nine to Five Mac has a great article here um, that we can show that's that explains that shows you how to watch the Super Bowl uh, against different places. So against different places, no, in different places. So it gives you the time of when and of course where it's happening in Tampa, Florida, and then you can watch it uh, on the CBS Sports app. Uh, on iPhone, iPad, and Apple TV, uh, CBS All Access, uh, Yahoo Sports, the NFL app, and um, they gave some give some information about the halftime show. I guess the weekend is the halftime uh, performance this year, and Miley Cyrus is doing something with TikTok. I don't know much about what's going on at the, <laughs> at the Super Bowl, but yes, there's Miley Cyrus at the the Super Bowl as well. Um, and then I think I want to show. Let's see. Let me find this really quick. Uh, the thing that truly matters, which is that most people have no idea that the Super Bowl is happening this weekend, and there's a hilarious video um, where a person asks a bunch of their friends um, about who's playing at the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is this weekend. Who's playing? I don't know. <laughs> who's playing? <laughs> Two, teams. Like, Two teams. Paul, the Super Bowl is this weekend. Who's playing? Tom Brady. <laughs> um, I mean, he's not wrong. Wait, it's this weekend? <laughs> Show me. The, t yes. the Super Bowl is this weekend. Who's playing? I have no idea. <laughs> Tom Brady? What's Steven? Hi, Steven and Eric. Eric and Steven, the Super Bowl is this weekend. Who's playing? No idea. I have no idea. Here's the the Super part. Bowl is this weekend. Who's playing? There's no way to know. <laughs> the Super Bowl is this weekend. <laughs> That's it. There's no way to know. That's how I felt about it. Um, but yes, you can go check out the Super Bowl uh, via those different apps. And we'll, of course, include the link in the show notes so that you can uh, figure out which places to watch it. Uh, Tom Brady is not a Patriot anymore. He plays for the Buccaneers now. Um, he made that move recently. So now I know, now you know. Uh, let us move on to one of the most important segments of the show, Rosemary Orchard. It is 
our feedback section. All righty. Our first bit of feedback comes from Kevin. Kevin writes, I want to request either a segment or a show dedicated to how to make shortcuts. It seems like a very powerful tool. However, I haven't had much success making them. On the sleep show, Rosemary mentioned having a shortcut to have a special watch face be loaded for bedtime. That's just one example. So, Rosemary, do you have some news for Kevin? Well, uh, you and I had a little word, you know, off off camera and, uh, you know, by iMessage or actually I think it was email. And we're going to do a show on this for you, Kevin, because there's a lot of great things you can do in shortcuts. Um, and we figured that why not dedicate an entire show on, you know, easy things to get started with in shortcuts so that you can dive in and uh, learn it. And we'll make sure to include that example. If there's any other examples people would like us to include, feel free to email us and we'll have those contact details at the end of the show. Absolutely. All righty. Um, this next one comes from James and uh, buckle in. It's going to be a second, but we'll get through it. Uh, I watched the sleep episode. Thank you, James, last night and really liked the dark noise app that Rosemary showed and talked about. I was impressed with the idea of shortcut integration in particular, as well as some of the other features. So I bought the app and started playing around with it, but I ran into an issue. I haven't really messed with shortcuts too much, but I'm trying to get more familiar with them. Most recently in regards to this app, what I was trying to do was create an iOS shortcut that would play a certain sleep sound in dark noise when launched, but do it through my bedroom HomePod mini as opposed to my phone's built-in speaker. Unfortunately, I didn't see any ability to do this unless I'm just not looking in the right spot. I tried digging into the shortcuts app as well as the home app, but nothing appeared to support this level of functionality. I believe there is a scripting ability in shortcuts, though I didn't try messing around with that. I noticed that if my phone was already defaulted to the HomePod for audio, it would use that when I launched launch the dark noise shortcut, but that wouldn't be the case 99% of the time when I would want to launch it right before bed. While the situation for me was specific to dark noise, I imagine it would apply to a lot of other audio generating apps. So is there any way that a shortcut can be created or something similar to get an app like dark noise to play its audio through a specific home pod by default when launched? Rosemary Orchard, take it away. Oh, boy. James, I've got exactly the action for you. Anna, I, I actually did already email James and he said this is working. So I'm very pleased about it. There is a scripting action inside of shortcuts called set playback destination. And if you select the set playback destination, depending on what devices you've got available, then, you know, you could set it to your your iPhone. If you've got AirPods uh, connected, then you can set it to AirPods. If you've got HomePods around, you can set it to HomePods. Uh, and if you've got Apple TVs, you can even set it to that. I'm just going to tap cancel because my HomePod mini is not here. I had to decamp to a secondary recording location due to an internet connectivity issue today. Uh, but set playback destination, if you set that, uh, you can do this before or after the play action. I like to do it before just because otherwise it starts playing and then it, it switches over and it, it's a little jarring or it, so it seems. Um, um, but then you can do that and then you start whatever it is. I've got my custom rain sound for 30 minutes. And uh, James actually emailed back and uh, he has... Uh, a, a bonus, which I already had done. I didn't, I excluded this when I was uh, emailing him because I didn't want to overwhelm him, but he has gone ahead and done it himself, which is a bonus. If uh, you get the name of your Wi-Fi network, you can check if you're on the network that your HomePod should be on. And only if it's on that network, do you set your playback destination, which means uh -huh. you always get your custom rain sound. But when we get back to travel and you're maybe staying in hotels or at friends' houses, it will just play it on your phone instead of uh, on uh, a HomePod that isn't there. Nice. That's fantastic. All righty. <clears throat> Kevin writes in, and this, I don't know if it's the same Kevin, uh, but this is uh, Kevin. Uh, on a recent episode, you had a viewer write, oh, and this is uh, not, not a question, but is instead a suggestion that maybe could help a recent viewer. On a recent episode, you had a viewer write in about a problem with a HomePod stereo pair having sound in just one speaker from their Apple TV. You had suggested unpairing and repairing them, but I wonder if the problem is a setting that might have been changed on the Apple TV. In the accessibility menu, there is an option for balance. Most people probably have it set to center, but it could have accidentally been changed to set the balance so that the sound only came out of one speaker. Now, Kevin, not only is this, and uh, Kevin's included a short or a screenshot of that page, uh, so you can see there the balance in the accessibility menu. Cool. Um, 
Kevin, not only is this good advice to consider, but this is also potentially another troubleshooting issue. Uh, or tr not troubleshooting issue, but troubleshooting um, option. To have that listener who wrote in last week uh, change the balance to left or to right, depending on which HomePod wasn't working, and then listen for if the sound ends up coming out of one of those HomePods, and then changing it back to center. So if the audio sort of gets forced to come out of that home pod and it actually works and changing it back to center would in theory, uh, have kind of corrected the issue and you'd be able to hear them out of both. So I love this, Kevin, because this gives me another option. Um, if somebody ends up having this issue, I tell them go into this and see if you can kind of force the audio to come out of the other one, or if it's just silent on that side, because that'll help us figure out what we need to do next. So we appreciate you writing in. Yes, and this we'll last make sure that one. gets to Paul. Thank you, Paul. Yes. Um, and this last one <clears throat> comes from Matthew. Matthew writes in, I know it's not an iOS question, but I have a hardware question. And I want to note here, Matthew, we happily answer hardware questions. Anybody who wants to write in about hardware questions related to uh, all of the iDevices, always feel free to. Uh, Matthew says, is there a car charger available for the iPhone 12 that uses both MagSafe to hold it to the mount and excuse me, to the mount, not mouth, uh, and also offers wireless charging. I'm a delivery person and being able to just easily uh, set my phone down and it starts charging would be great. Now I have to release it from the cradle of the phone holder and disconnect the charging cable manually. Um, so, Rosemary, I had included a, uh, a link to an option in the app, Apple App Store, or excuse me, in the Apple Store and... Lo and behold, I was uh, incorrect. I thought that this was. Um, yeah. so I thought that this also Belkin, charged. Go ahead. Yeah, Bell can make a MagSafe mount, event mount for um, for the iPhone 12 um, and 12 Pro and 12 Pro Max. Um, but it's it, while it's MagSafe, it does not charge, unfortunately. And there are very few genuine MagSafe options out there. However, in uh, episode 533, we talked about in 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 the in the, uh, in the feedback section at the end of the show, we talked about my solution, which uses a standard magnetic mount. Now you could get a vent mount, you could get a CD mount, you could just get something that sticks on your dash, and then you put a MagSafe charger on that. Now you're going to need to get a USB-C um, uh, cigarette lighter charger or something because MagSafe is USB-C, um, and I would suggest trying to get a higher powered one. Um, and you do need to kind of be a little careful sliding your phone off of the dock. It's not going to be perfect, unfortunately. At least mine isn't. However, if you have a look on Etsy and Amazon, you may find some mounts for MagSafe chargers which fit your vehicle. So I would recommend buying a mount for the MagSafe and then the MagSafe and the charger. So you're going to have to buy three separate parts, but you're going to get the, the MagSafe solution that way. Belkin, unfortunately, have not made a charging version of this. This is just like when uh, the, the iPhone got rid of the headphone port and they were only selling a lightning to lightning and lightning adapter instead of a, a lightning to headphone and lightning adapter. Uh, it seems to take them a while to come out with what we actually want, but I'm sure we'll get there eventually. Yeah, so... <sighs> The one thing um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see companies create this eventually. Uh, it's just not out yet. But the one thing that you could do, um, it'll cost you a little bit of extra money uh, to do this. And I'm trying to find a place. Oh, Anthony, I'll put the link below. <clears throat> um, Skosh makes a device that you can mount in different places. You can put it in a cup holder. You can mount it on top of your dash. Uh, or you can mount it to your windshield and you buy separately the Apple MagSafe charger to pop into it. And then it works as both a MagSafe holder and the charger because it is just that MagSafe puck. So you provide your own MagSafe puck to it. But then once you have that, you can put your phone onto it and then it would be held as you can see here, uh, by that, uh, by that mount. So then you can, you know, install it in different ways. So Skosh has three different mounts available, uh, including one that's telescoping, which is kind of cool, um, available between $29.99 and $39.99. And again, you will have to add your own 
uh, your own MagSafe charging puck. But, you know, if you don't need it quite at this moment, um, give it a little bit of time and then you Mm -hmm. should be able to uh, get something from Belkin because there are lots of third-party options that are available, but a lot of them are made by companies that I just, I've never heard of before and I don't know if they offer Apple's you know, standard MagSafe charging, uh, or MagSafe charging standard rather, uh, versus just being a charger that has a magnet in the back, if that makes sense. Like I want to make sure that I'm using something that is, is Apple authorized to be a MagSafe charger. I think uh, Peak Design was doing yeah. a, a MagSafe car charger too that would work with a MagSafe. Yeah, Peak Design are doing oh. um, a series of magnetic um, accessories uh, which mm-hmm. work with MagSafe, but it's not MagSafe directly. So you would have to have a Peak Design case, I believe, uh, for this. Um, there are some other uh, authorized magnetic chargers out there. Anchor make one, but it will not charge at the same speeds as the MagSafe. And if you are Wait, a delivery Anchor person, I presume you. Yes, uh, Anchor has one, but it does not charge at the same speeds as um, uh, the um, oh, as MagSafe, and so it's this a charging is puck, from. But it's not. A yeah, it's a charging puck. Uh, so gotcha. I uh, let me just check. Somebody linked me to this Chumley in the chat room. Thank you very much, Chumley, for the link. I knew Anchor come out with these, but I didn't know if they were available yet. Um, so, um, but yeah, so this is a magnetic wireless charger. Um, so th- these are the same size as the MagSafe though. So that might reduce the price, uh, from $39 to about $24 for the actual MagSafe component, but it depends on how quickly you need to charge your phone. I would suggest if you're a delivery person, you've probably got apps on your phone open all the time and you're switching between them constantly, probably using a lot of battery life. I'd go with the, the better charger and the higher watt, uh, you know, charging part simply because you're going to benefit from it and actually use it all the time. Yeah, in fact, I'm probably going probably going to purchase one of these Skosh uh, chargers <clears throat> simply because uh, there are so many different options that they have available. Um, yeah. And the, what I love about it is that Skosh has taken into consideration, unlike some companies that cars are all built differently and a different solution may be better for you than some others. Uh, so with Scotia's options, you get the ability to have things set up exactly how you want. I like that. Um, you know, you can get the device that works perfectly for you. All right. I think it's time to cue the new music. Oh! <laughs> Am I supposed Oops. to put on my app cap now? Yeah, this is this is the period of time where we put on our caps. <laughs> well, I did give the chat room a spoiler earlier that my hat has ears, and uh, not only do, do I have ears, I also have a little bow on the front of the ears and a hat behind the ears. Nice. Howdy there, y'all! It is time for our app caps. Folks, these are our app picks of the week. The apps that we're either uh, are, are new to us, but we're excited about are apps that we've been using for a real long time now that we want to share with all of you. And if you're out there listening and aren't, you know, uh, tuning in to the video, you may be wondering why the heck I'm talking in this accent. Well, that's because I'm wearing a big old cowboy hat right here on my head, right here on my noggin, as it were. Uh, so... Rosemary Orchard, you with your bunny bunny eared hat. Why don't you tell us about your app pick of the week? Well, I fell into Wonderland this week, hence the bunny ears. Um, and I discovered this great app called Flipkit. And Flipkit is a flip book building app for iPad. And so I'm just going to open this sample one of a frog. And so this is inside Flipkit. They created this. This is an example you can download. And if I just tap play, then you can hopefully see a little frog and there's a fly going around him and he's sticking out his tongue trying to catch the fly and pulling a face. Um, and he can catch the fly. And this is a flip book animation. Um, and this is really cute. And I love it. And not only do you have these wonderful examples, but you can make your own with this and it's using the standard iOS markup tools and you can add photos and more and Flipkit is free. 
So um, you can download this for free and there's a $2.99 in-app purchase, which gives you an unlimited number of frames per uh, book that you make, animation settings, and you can export as videos, GIFs, and images. And of course, it supports development of FlipKit, which is great. And $2.99, it's very cheap. Um, and oops. I will uh, leave a review for them later. Um, but they have this great one about building a paper plane. Um, and I just want to go through and dissect this a little bit. So to start with, on the left, you have your, your frames. And then in the center, you have the current frame that you're working on with the markup tools, which you can move around. I'd like to put these over at the side and then some other options. But behind your main frame, there's a poster, which you can go through and edit. So I'm just going to add a little bit of shading here in the bottom right, which is now red. And now as I go through, that is on every single one of these frames. Um, and then I can go through right to the end of this. Um, and I'm just going to uh, duplicate this frame by tapping and holding it. And then I'm going to tap duplicate. And I'm just going to grab my marker here. And I'm going to add some confetti. Because I feel that once you've successfully built a paper plane, there should be confetti going around for uh, you to celebrate that you have successfully launched it and it's currently flying and not crashing into the floor. And so I just added this frame by duplicating an existing frame. But now wow. when I play it, you see, you know, th this is, you know, all stuff that you can do with the, the markup tools. Uh, so it's a great use of the iPad. And uh, yeah, now we actually have some uh, confetti in there and I love it. It's so cute. And you can, you know, you don't have to be a great artist because you can do it with photos. So you can, you know, do stop motion with pictures and actually, I'll just pop back into this one and into the settings because you can specify how many frames per second, background color, whether or not it should loop, if if your film strip goes, you know, from from left to right or right to left or just top down, things like that. And oh, I love this; it's so great, and it, it's a great iPad app as well. So it fits with today's theme. I love that, and I, I exactly you you do a good job of making the your app cap also fit with the the show. Uh, theme, and I am going to continue to be a rebel and not do that. Um, As you do, but <laughs> I'm going to have to check out FlipKit because I used to love taking little, um, cutting out you know squares and drawing on them and making little flip books. Uh, so this is a nice way to do it digitally, and I can make I don't know some, something to do with my dogs always, like them oh, walking along or something. I look forward to um, sharing that video with me. And you know I will it's whenever it's done. Uh, the app that I am choosing for this week is one that is uh, it's available for free in the App Store, and it is an app for folks who and, and I have to say it is a United States uh, kind of focused app. Uh, so I apologize for that. But you know maybe if you live outside of the United States and for some reason you want to uh, bury yourself in kind of political content from the United States. Don't do that. But if you do, for some reason, then you can. Uh, this app is called The Recount. And it is an app that throughout the day gives you little bites of video kind of explaining uh, in a timeline, explaining kind of what has happened in the day. So you can see the, the last update was at 1.08 p.m. And it shows Treasury Secretary Yellen um, the economic crisis crises hit people of color harder. I'm worried the current crisis will do this again. Um, but we can start to scroll back and see things that have happened today all throughout the day. So I get a little summary of like at five this morning, um, Rudy Giuliani, uh, had, a, I don't know, I, I would have to read more into that, but, um, yeah, there was a disclaimer that I guess he got on his WABC radio show uh, that came before the radio show. And then here's one that's outside of the U.S. Uh, the U.K. will require travelers arriving from COVID hotspots to quarantine in hotels starting February 15th. Um, Biden on relief. It's not just the macroeconomic impact on the economy. We got a chance to do something big here and then uh, more stuff throughout the day. So... This is uh, very easy. It's, this part's called The Wire, and it's really nice for kind of getting the quick updates and knowing kind of point to point what was going on. But then next to The Wire are shows, and there are different shows in here, including some ones that aren't um, quite you know related to news in the moment. So artist Lauren Harris might be the next Lisa Frank, and uh, there's a little story here about uh, Lauren Harris. But then... 
the daily recount. And this is, if you're not able to kind of stay with the little timeline that's taking place, you can check out the daily recount to get the news breakdown of what happened in the day. Um, then there's like the spotlight, the center ring. So there are all these little kind of mini shows about different topics uh, that are given throughout the day. So I um, kind of felt like over the past four years, I had been... Uh, it's not that I felt like it. I did. I was. I, I, well, let me try this again. So I came from at one point uh, for several years, I was uh, a journalist who covered all sorts of, of news, political news and world news and I mean everything. And that meant that I had to be constantly steeped in news, 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 day in and day out so that I could be up to date on everything. Uh, that was when I worked for a company called Newsy. And I gave myself permission after that to take a break from being so up to date on the news. And so while I worked at Mobile Nations and during my time as a freelancer, um, I stepped away from that. And then in the last four years, as a sort of way to protect myself, um, I, you know, didn't, didn't go as deep into uh, what was going on day to day and instead kind of looked at the bigger picture kind of stuff. But now, as things have changed, I want to kind of pick up a little bit more of knowing what's going on day to day or week to week, if it were, as it were. And so because of that, this app has helped me do that without it being incredibly uh, um, overwhelming or uh, incredibly like just too much information. And so this pulls from kind of big sources uh, and as much as it can pulls directly from, you know, like C-SPAN and things like that, which is the United States, uh, uh, the, the U.S. government's tool for putting out news and uh, the judiciary in the legislative branch and in the executive branch. And so I am really liking the recount and what it is doing uh, as it kind of gives me a rundown for the day, more so than I've seen other apps do those daily rundowns. So yeah, that's the recount. If you are at all a nerd, uh, a political nerd, then it's definitely an app for you. And if you're not, and you're just looking for a way to kind of get the rewind of the day. Uh, you might check out the recount. It's available for free in the app store. Um, I haven't had to give it my location or anything like that. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how it's making money. It could be that the, the site, the recount is where they make their money on ads and things like that. Uh, but the app itself, I've not had any thing pop up that's, you know, showing me why it's available for free. Um, but yeah, you should definitely check it out. Uh, it's in the app store and it's called the recount. All righty, folks, that brings us to the end of yet another episode of iOS today. If you have questions out there, you've seen our ability to answer them, uh, and we appreciate that. And so you can send those to iOS today at twits.tv, uh, video, audio, try to keep those under 30 seconds or text format. All of it works. iOS today at twit.tv. I want to give a shout out to, uh, the many folks, folks, no, I want to give a shout out to the many folks out there who took a time, who took the time to write a review for us in uh, Apple podcasts. Um, I think that iOS today is actually leading the charge among the Twitch shows. If we can brag about it a little bit of uh, new iOS or new reviews in the apps in the Apple podcast library, we have Rosemary Orchard to thank for that. Um, you have that great video showing folks how to, uh, rate and review in the Apple podcasts library. So if you want to hop on the party, uh, join the train of fun and, uh, awesome, <laughs> then give us a review at the Apple podcast library. Uh, you can just leave some stars if you want to, but if you'd like, you can write something out. And as I've said before, head to instagram.com slash twit.tv. Uh, because we've got a post where Rosemary explains the whole process of leaving a review in the Apple Podcast Library. Um, oh, and of course, if you are tuning in live, we appreciate you. If you'd like to tune in live, uh, you can do that by going to twit.tv slash live. And uh, we record the show every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is 11 a.m. Pacific or 1800 UTC, twit.tv slash live. But the best way to watch the show is by going to twit.tv slash iOS 
and subscribing to the show in audio or video formats. That way you get it as soon as it's out. You don't have to worry about tuning in live. You can just see the final show when it's ready. We're on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, anywhere you are, we can be uh, as long as it's a podcast app. And uh, yeah, in both audio and video formats. So make your choice. We, I think this show, it really lends itself well to video, but you don't have to do that. Um, you can just get it in audio and we do try to be mindful of that as well. Uh, but we appreciate it. Now, Rosemary Orchard, if uh, folks want to follow you online, where do they go to do that? The best place to go is rosemaryorchard.com where you can find links to uh, all the things I do, podcasts and uh, books and everything else. And uh, of course, links to follow me nicely on social media. Uh, Mike, uh, where can people find you? Well, you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to all the places I exist online. Um, I'm at Micah Sargent on as many social media networks as I possibly can be. Uh, so you can find me there. That is going to do it for us. Another episode of iOS Today is in the can. Just kidding, just kidding. That was Mac Break Weekly, but this episode is over. <laughs> Goodbye, folks. <laughs> Sometimes the news of the week is best told by the people making and breaking it, and that is the essence of Tech News Weekly. Join me, Jason Howell, along with my co-host, Micah Sargent, as we interview the people who are breaking the news that you're probably already talking about. Plus, sometimes we actually get the people who are making the news, the people behind the story. That's Tech News Weekly on twit.tv. Twit.tv.